بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الذي أنزل الفرقان على عبده ليكون للعالمين نذيرا والصلاة والسلام على خير خلق ونور عرش أفضل الأنبياء والمرسلين حبيبنا وسيدنا وسندنا وشفيعنا ومولانا أبي القاسم محمد صلوات الله محمد وعلى محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين المأسمين المظلومين أما بعد فقد قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتاب المجيد وقوله الحق وهو أسلق الصادقين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله ولتنظر نفس ما قدمت لغد واتقوا الله إن الله خبير بما تعملون ولا تكونوا كالذين نصوا الله فأنساهم أنفسهم أولئك هم الفاسقون صدق الله العلي العظيم صلى الله على محمد وآل محمد All praise belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I begin in his blessed name for granting us this life and this existence and the ability to recognize his infinite mercy and to consider us as his representatives on earth to promote good and forbid evil and to be the flag bearers of justice and equity on earth. And I bid you, my respected Sheikh Jafar, my respected sisters and brothers in Islam, Assalamu alaikum jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. As we continue on these nights of Ashura, as you know that the event of Ashura took place on the 10th day of Muharram, which is why it's called Ashura. And of course, we prepare ourselves and discuss those moments upon which we try to reflect as to why this event has taken place and what the message behind this event is and hopefully we can take lessons from them so that we can apply them upon ourselves to better ourselves. And as you know it culminates till the 10th of Ashura. So these companions that we speak about who became martyred all became martyred on that same day unless of course it happened especially like Muslim in Aqil which happened in Dhul Hijjah. Otherwise, you will notice that the companions of Karbala all became martyred on that same day within a few hours. But of course, for the sake of brevity, because we have no time, we need to discuss these personalities. And there were many. As we know, we hear the 72, but actually there were more than 72. There were over 100 who became martyred in Karbala. And historians say at least 16 Soldiers from Yazid's army um, absconded their positions and ran away and joined the army of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. Sixteen. Interestingly in history, not a single one on Imam Hussein alayhi salam's side left to go to Yazid's army. Not a single one. Though they knew they were going to be butchered and annihilated physically, but uh, nonetheless not a single one left. That's proof positive to show that when our blessed Imam Hussain stated that my companions are the finest in the world, undoubtedly that is so true. For he selected them, he chose them, and he welcomed them because they were the only ones who were capable of truly holding the banner of justice and equity for humanity till the day of judgment. So these companions that we speak about, and tonight I will speak of some of these companions, particularly two of them. One is name is Anas ibn Harif Asadi. As you know, he was a companion of the Holy Prophet. So these were old men. And uh, Muslim ibn Awsaja al-Asadi, he was also from the Banu Asad tribe. He was also a companion of the Holy Prophet. And Muslim ibn Awsaja, as you know, was also a memorizer of the Quran and he was in his 70s and Anas ibn Harif some say was well in his 90s quite old what's beautiful about Karbala is the fact that not a single age group has been left out in remembering the tragedy of Karbala not a single group young and old tall short rich and poor every strata as we say of the society has been represented in Karbala. Women, children, adults, 
everybody. Dark-skinned, brown-skinned, light-skinned, everyone was there. People from various faiths, as I mentioned the other day, Abdullah ibn Umair uh, al-Kalbi was actually from the Christian faith, and you find that he was present, and people of all faiths and backgrounds were in that um, army. There were owners of servants and servants themselves. Everyone was present in that. So we have to ask the question, who are these people and why were they there? And why is it that nowhere in the annals of history do you find such representation across the board that is purely representing the moral, moral argument for the promotion of good and the demotion of evil? That's the only reason they were there. Not a single one was there to guard their property. In fact, they were giving it away, you see. They, they gave everything for themselves, you know, for, for the sake of Allah, everything. وَجَاهَدُوا بِأَمْوَالِهِمْ وَأَنفُسِهِمْ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ Allah says, they struggle. وَجَاهَدُوا بِأَمْوَالِهِمْ with their, with their wealth وَأَنفُسِهِمْ with their selves for the sake of Allah. As we say, قُلِ نَصَلَاتِ وَنُسُكِ وَمَحْيَايَ وَمَمَاتِ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ قُلِ نَصَلَاتِ My prayer, my sacrifice, my life and my death are all for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How do we reach that stage? These conversations are very important for us so that we understand that it is because of Allah we exist. It is because of Allah we persist. And it is because of Allah we benefit. And we will return to Him. Please understand that. When Allah says, Allah bi dhikrillahi tatsma'inna al Indeed, it is the remembrance of Allah that calms the hearts down. This doesn't mean you sit in the corner and do tasbih all day. This is not what Allah means when He says, Allah bi dhikrillah. Dhikrillah doesn't mean that. It includes that, but it doesn't exclusively mean that. Dhikrillah is every breath you take, every transaction, every relationship, every sentence we utter, every pleasure point we have, every sad moment we have is all dhikrillah. Allah bi dhikrillahi tatma'innal qulu. When hearts become tranquil. We're living in a world today where society is very confused. As you know, and I will talk about this, and I know some of you may not like what I'm going to say. But truth is essential, and I think we need to face it. I know that within some cultures, we are addicted to certain substances by which we find to be an instrument of so-called social relations, such as shisha, argili, scientific name called Hubble bubble. Um, you will notice it's actually a hundred times more deleterious more dangerous than cigarettes. Now cigarettes are bad. Even cigarette companies like R.J. Reynolds and Philip Morris all agree unanimously that if they were to expose the true dangers of such substances, they would go bankrupt. But they, they're very smart. What they do is they, any society that's litigating, such as the United States, where lawsuits can easily be placed upon them, they protect themselves by financing anti-smoking ads. So that should they ever go to court, they will present an argument that, look, we were conscientious and conscious as a company that we warned them. And even the Surgeon General says, smoking is bad for you on the box. Hmm. Interesting. You know, when you read a box, when you buy a product, a food, they say, don't eat this. This is poison for you. Would you buy it? No. But cigarettes, we do. It's, it's weird. Something wrong with the human race, right? But we find that our addiction is so strong in that direction. For what? Oh, it calms me down. It, you know, makes me think better. Hmm? It takes me in the right direction. Think about it. When Allah says, Allah bi dhikri al qulub. Dhikr of Allah, meditation, cogitation, hmm? reflection is better for you than all these outside substances that are dangerous, harmful, they harm our environment. Today, you find that global warming by some foolish people, they call it a fake issue. They call it, um, you know, it's false. 
when it is so true that we're finding unprecedented storms and unprecedented uh, melting of the Arctic zones that will flood the world. People don't realize that these are all blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we're destroying our environment thinking there's nothing wrong with it. The hydrocarbons that we produce in societies today that are so dangerous and deleterious. When we are intelligent enough to have EV cars, you know, electric cars, which inshallah soon will come about, and thank God for that. But what we find is in the process, we're highly destructive and causing destruction in our nature. Killing animals, just because of some issue, we are killing elephants, we're killing lions, we're killing all kinds of creatures to find some substance from them. And then the poachers are going into these jungles and killing and destroying and causing their extinction with no regard that Allah has placed all of this as a gift upon mankind and we need to be conscious about it. But why are we so reckless with it? Why are we so careless with it? It's because we've lost our ways. We've become apathetic and we are confused and we're therefore angry and anger leads to self-destruction. I remember a girl who was asked that question, do you do drugs in the United States? It was on television. Do you do drugs? And this girl, an American girl, Caucasian girl, gave one of the best answers I've ever heard with, with wisdom. She said, I haven't gotten angry enough to start it. Brilliant answer. I have not gotten angry enough to start it. Meaning many a times children and adults who indulge in such opioids and self-destructive behavior is because they've lost hope and hence it leads to anger. It leads to loss of faith because I don't have anything else now. It's like I'm free falling and there's nothing I can hold on to. So why not just self-destruct? When Allah has honored us, as I mentioned yesterday, God says we have made you special. We have chosen you among all creation. Brothers and sisters, we fail to understand the basic realities and this is why we're there. And I want to talk about this today because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to question us on Judgment Day. He's going to question us that what did you do with my gifts that I gave you? Did you abuse them? Hmm? Risalat al huquq if you read by Imam Zain al-Abidin Imam describes everything has a right. The floor has a right, trees have a right, animals have a right, atoms have a right, our skin has a right, our eyes have a right. There is not an object, not a substance in this universe that does not demand its own right. Just like you and I as human beings have our rights. But when we violate those rights, then Allah will question us on Judgment Day. That I endowed you with so much, what did you do with it? Now why do we become self-destructive? I believe when we are misinformed, misaligned, when we lack understanding, we're confused. It's like being lost in a jungle and your GPS is not working. It's a very, very precarious state of existence. If you ever get lost somewhere and you don't know which direction to go, it's a very uncomfortable feeling. Even when the earth shakes, it's a very uncomfortable feeling. I experienced it in the Philippines. I was uh, on the top floor of a hotel in Manila and the earthquake was taking place and my whole room was moving literally four or five feet, one side to the other. I felt like I was on the ship, you know, like I was literally on, on the seas. And I knew I had to leave the room, but I was thinking, should I take my passport? Should I take my things? Do I have enough time? Do I take the elevator? Do I take the stairs? Because I'm on the top floor. That's, those few minutes were so full of trepidation. When Allah said, لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي كَبَدْ We have created mankind in a state of trepidation. Uncertainty, slippery. You can never guarantee anything. Somebody promises you something, that doesn't mean they will deliver it. There is no such thing as stability with humanity or with nature per se. Anything could happen. The earth can crack and throw you down. The building you're in can collapse. There is no guarantee 
There's only one guarantee, which is Allah. We are from Him and we return to Him. That is guaranteed. There's nothing you, can I, you and I can do to change that. And I remember I walked away and I took the elevator. I felt calm. And I felt, you know, when Allah says, إِذَا زُلْزِلَتِ الْأَرْضُ زِلْزَالَهَا When the earth shakes, and for the first time I experienced it, realizing, oh my God, how blessed we are to be within stable foundations. And Allah says, I've made you in a state of trepidation. What are you going to do with it? Now, if you lose hope in it, you become angry. You lose hope and you find people are very irritated. You find when you drive on the roads, people have road rage. Even if you get near them, if you don't give the signal, they get angry. They're blowing their horn at you. People are full of anger. Here, one time I arrived at 2 o'clock in the morning. I went to look for something to eat. And I said, okay, 2 o'clock in the morning, I won't get bothered. I make a right turn, somebody's blowing the horn behind me. I said, la hawla wa la, 2 o'clock in the morning, why are you blowing the horn at me? Like nothing but anger, full of anger, rage. Find a reason to vent. And if there's somebody you can punch, or somebody you can scream at, or some explicative you can use by which to vent. Vent, vent, vent. We forget that that venting leads to negative reaction. What goes around comes around. When we're venting, others will start venting too. And before you know it, we have chaos. And next thing you know, we're killing each other. And then we're realizing, why are we doing this? When Allah says, I'm your stability. Maintain your faces upright. فَأَقِمْ وَجْهَكَ لِلدِّينِ حَنِيفًا فِطْرَةَ اللَّهِ اللَّتِي It's a system of God. فَطَرَ النَّاسَ عَلَيْهَا In which He has placed upon mankind into you. And God doesn't change His system. لَا تَبْدِيلَ لِخَلْقِ اللَّهِ ذَلِكَ الدِّينُ الْقَيِّمُ This is the upright religion. The uprightness that we must focus and figure out where our problems are. When I study the world's movements today, in the United States, depression has increased by 30%. Suicide has increased that much. More people are killing themselves in the United States than they're getting killed. Think about it, including our children. Why? These smartphones have become a means to depression. Research shows anything over two hours of social interaction leads to depression. Why? You might think, but I'm connected with the world. Yes, but it's a different kind of world. It's a make-believe world many a times. You don't have to face the facts in the cyber world. I've seen kids come to camp, they don't even know how to shake my hands. They come, they're looking like... You think they're like semi-autistic or something. But then you listen to them socially. Oh, chatter away, my God, opinionated, Mr. Fancy Schmancy. So I look at them and said, what is this with you? Bipolar? Like, why are you this way? But there you're that way. Well, there I can hide under this garb. So they live two lives, multiple personality syndromes, you know? Like we're believing that we are two different creatures. And then we can't face the facts, so we live in cyber world now. We live in virtual worlds, and our entire fantasy is in virtual worlds where we can control. Kids who are addicted to gaming, I had one boy, he came to me last year in the lecture, he sat there, he said, this is the first time I've come to listen to a lecture. So what have you been doing? He says, I've been, I'm busy playing games. I said, all day? He says, yeah, 18 hours a day. I mean, you could tell. I said, why do you do this? He says, what else is there to do? I said, can I give you a word of advice? He said, yes. I said, I think you've lost control. I think you calculated life and you felt there's no hope. He's looking at me, 16 year old boy, smart. He said, what do you mean? I said, I think you've calculated loss of control in life and that joystick gives you control. And you're so in love with the joystick, it gives you power. Is that true? He said, I never thought of it that way, but you might be right. I said, my advice to you is get out of that joystick, leave your cocoon and get out of that cave and start facing facts. For when you meet people, it's a beautiful relationship. Researchers say one of the best things you can ever do is say hello to a stranger. You know how you succeed in life? Say hello to a stranger. You might think, what? Succeed in life? That's right. Just say hello to a stranger. You'd be surprised who you will meet.
And that person may open up your life in a thousand ways. If you ever study people who are very successful, you ask them, how did you get here? How did you know Mr. X and Mr. Y and Miss X and Miss Y? Oh, I said hello to that one. And that one opened up, and then the next thing, the conversation started. And we started sharing relationships. And before you know it, I was party to this growth. Many a times we live in cocoons, we don't even leave our own little world. So when our young children are depressed, it's, it's what we call symptomatic in the sense that there's something missing and that's why the child is there. It's not because this thing is so attractive that it has absolutely eclipsed everything else. No. It's interesting, you go to a restaurant, I see it sometimes, you see that mom, dad, all the kids, everybody, mom, dad, everybody's on this, on a, on a dinner table. It's interesting, five people sitting, they're all on this. That's, a, that's an indicator, something's wrong with this family. Like, why would you be on a phone? People say, like, if you're not on the phone, you're weird, <laughs> right? I mean, you're sitting on a dinner table, look at each other. Smile and say, what happened today? What happened at school today? Look at them in the eye. No, I'm in my little world. You know, I have kids who say, I said, what are you doing? So I'm talking to my dad. I said, he's across the table. I know. <laughs> I said, why don't you say hello to him? He said, I can't. And my dad cannot say hello to me. It's only through this medium. I said, we have a serious problem. Salawat ala Muhammad wa al Muhammad. Today, we're living in a world where we're chasing so many dreams. It's good to chase dreams. There's nothing wrong to chase dreams. It's nothing wrong to be ambitious. It's good to want to conquer the universe. Do it, Allah says. But do it properly. Do it in the right ways. Don't lose, you know, your connection with Allah. You and I are created humans. Think about it. Look around us, there are all kinds of creatures. There are so many creatures in the world, we cannot count them. If you go into the sea today, our measurements of what is, lies under the sea is probably only 20% of what we actually know of what the ocean put, holds. Jacques Cousteau spent his entire life, he said, I know only a few percentage points of what lies in this great ocean. It's so great. That's just the ocean on earth. Hmm? What about space? What about the planets out there? What about the creations out there? But let's examine the creations on earth today. We see quadrupeds, bipeds. We see creatures that are on their bellies. Quran mentions them. But you and I are humans. We're supine, homo sapiens, sapien, intelligent with speech. We have the power to control our environments. We take creatures and use them to our benefits. Think about it. That's how powerful we are as a creation. And Allah says, I made you that way. I enabled you this. Now let me ask us a question. What did we do when we were nothing to ask God to make us humans? Because you and I could have been born donkeys. We could have been born horses. We could have been born dogs, pigs, snakes, atoms. Something, trees, but we're not any of the above. We're humans. Who chose us as humans? Who decided to make me higher in the stage of creations? Allah says, I did. I chose you. Subhanallah, isn't that enough? I don't need to talk further. Isn't that enough proof against us? Should we be self-destructive? Isn't that enough? I ask anybody on this, in this room or the world. Isn't that enough? That I could have been born a cow waiting to be slaughtered after I was milked. Hmm? Think about it. When you look at that cow, it's a mercy of Allah. It's incredibly a merciful creation. Allah says, but I made you better than this one. This one is subservient to you. How dare? You cause trouble on earth. ظهر الفساد في البر والبحر بما كسبت أيدي الناس By the hands of mankind, you're creating fitna and fasad, Allah says. How? When I chose you human, I could have made you a donkey. And all day you would have been carrying things on your back for nothing. 
Although donkeys are a beautiful creation, let's not underestimate them. But Allah says, I made you better than them. لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي أَحْسَنِ تَقْوِيمٍ ثُمَّ رَدَدْنَاهُ أَسْفَلَ سَافِلِينَ We made mankind in the best of forms. Then we lowered them to the lowest of the low. Why? Because when human beings refuse to admit and accept this mercy, this unwarranted mercy, undeserving mercy, you and I have received mercy that none of us on this earth deserve. Don't you and I dare say, I deserve to be human. By what standard do you and I deserve? By what quality do you and I deserve to be humans? Please answer me. I want us all to think about this. If anybody's got an answer, talk to me after this lecture. I'm curious to know. Because it's absurdly, ridiculously logical, isn't it? Hmm? But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I created you. I shaped you. I shaped you. I made you unique. Even your fingerprint is unique. That even if you're identical twins and you share identical DNA matter, yet your fingerprints are different. And if you look at the biometrics of a human being, their eyes, all of their factors put together makes you so unique, you are one of a kind in the universe. Isn't that incredible? Allah says, I shaped you this way. I gave you this endowment. Hmm? I gave you. Did we not give you two eyes? Aynain, walisan, tongue, shafatain, two lips, and guide you to the path? Are you not happy with this? This is the conversation. When I see people smoking, first and foremost, we've lost hope in this humanity. That God, you made me human, I'm not happy. Let me poison myself. Does that make sense? If I ask a child this question, you know what makes me really sad? Is when we as adults, are reckless in our behavior and then we become role models for our young generations who consider it cool to be smoking this trash smoking weed people come to me and say it's medicinal brother it's medicinal so what do you know about medicine where's well, medicinal it's like spinning his head it's medicinal <laughs> really I said you know what tetrahydrocannabinol is it's an alcohol that causes your brain to shrink and it leads you to psychosis. Did you know that? You know, they've legalized marijuana in the United States. Wait another 20 years and see. We'll have zombies walking around all over America. Because when this stuff is legalized, and everybody's taking it over the counter, and you got this multi-billion dollar business starting now, and they have liquefied it now, of course, different grades, different colors too. Bah, we're so sophisticated these days. You know, got all kinds of, designer stuff too it's amazing we, we're not it's not enough just give me something take me to cloud nine Allah says I love it I'll take you to cloud nine halal way <laughs> and you'll be eternally happy no Allah I like this substance do you know that it shrinks the brain leads to psychosis and our little children are thinking oh you know he's smoking it's so cool you know in our high schools how many kids do that 80% of our kids are smoking weed today. 80%. Why? Is it because weed is just so delicious? It's more delicious than bananas and, you know, apples. And it's just amazing. It's the greatest thing in the world. Like you wake up in the morning, that's all you want. It stinks. Has a disgusting smell. You walk around, it's like you haven't taken a bath for a week. Yeah, but brother, I need it. For what? Well, it calms me down. I said, yeah, let me tell you something. You know, we've got physicians who get licensed and then they are licensed to prescribe this stuff. Now you got cocaine. Hmm? We've got morphine. Oh, it's not enough. <laughs> it sort of takes me to cloud four, you see. <laughs> I need to go to cloud 12. Oh, fentanyl. That's what you need, fentanyl. It'll take you right to cloud 12. Yeah, you take one extra drop of it, a milligram, and you're dead. People are falling like flies today, like flies. Fentanyl, like tens of thousands of people are dying every single day with fentanyl. People are buying cocaine, it's laced with fentanyl. And I'm thinking, 
What is wrong with humanity? Are we that deprived? Are we in such a bad state? Maybe if you're in prison and maybe you're getting whipped every day and you've got no hope and you're being tortured every hour, maybe you need some palliative care, which is where fentanyl is. Fentanyl is a palliative drug. It's an opioid designed to remove your pain. You're a healthy brother, healthy sister. What's wrong with you? Oh, brother, too many problems. Can't handle it. You know, my husband doesn't love me. You know, my dad is always fighting with me. We were supposed to be richer than our neighbors. We just couldn't get them Mercedes. It's a bala. It's a big problem. I can't stand this. Why did God even create me? You know what's hell? People think hell is when you burn in hell forever. No, that's temporary. Allah says, لَابِثِينَ فِيهَا أَحْقَابًا They will remain in that fire for a period. You know who will go through real hell? The one who insists on not being happy to be human. People like Yazid and Muawiyah were not happy to be human. Not happy. Iblis is not happy to receive the grace. So Allah lowers him to a lowest of the low. That's why Allah says, لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي أَحْسَنِ تَقْوِيمِ ثُمَّ رَدَدْنَاهُ Then we lower you. You know why? Allah says, I am so merciful that after I create you, I let you decide what you want. You want to enter Maqam Mahmud with the prophets and the imams? I will give that to you. You want to enter the lowest levels of hell? I will reward you with that too. You decide. When people go to the lowest level of hell, they didn't just go haphazardly. They worked hard. If you examine Yazid, he was constantly working hard to create fitna. Constant. He never stopped. Umar ibn Sa'ad, Marwan bin Hakam, all these people, if you look at them, they were constantly working hard. They worked hard to create fitna. Muawiyah lived his whole life creating fitna. Fitna. He used to sit with Umar bin As, and the Prophet used to see him and Muawiyah sit together. And the Prophet said, when these two sit together, sit between them. So as you know, Abdullah ibn Abbas, He's walking and he sees these two guys sitting together. Abdullah goes and sits right between them. So they look at him and said, you couldn't find a spot you sat between us? He said, yeah, the prophet told me, when the two of you sit together, I need to sit between you. Because I know when the two of you are together, you're working to create trouble. So I'm here to stop you from creating trouble. Some people just work hard. Shaitan, Iblis, when he fell from grace, rather than ask for forgiveness from God, God, I was arrogant, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have done this. You, you commanded me to bow, and you are the Almighty, you are the, the authority, you are the merciful one. Hmm? And therefore, I, I, I seek forgiveness. No, oh no. He says, you took me from my position because of that black mud creature called Adam? Huh, vindictiveness, arrogance. There are people like that in our societies. Vindictive, oh my God. If the earth was to crush itself, I will never forgive. Have you heard that people? People like that? And then they go into prayer. Allah, astaghfirullah rabbi wa atubil. Astaghfirullah, you can't forgive one brother. You're asking Allah for istighfar. How about you forgive your brother? Hmm? Allah says, وَسَارِعُوا إِلَىٰ مَغْفِرَةٍ مِنْ رَبِّكُمْ وَجَنَّةٍ عَرْضُ السَّمَاوَاتُ وَالْأَرْضُ وَعِدَّتْ لِلْمُتَّقِينَ الَّذِينَ يُنْفِقُونَ فِي السَّرَّاءِ وَالدَّرَّاءِ وَالْكَاظِمِينَ الْغَيْرِ وَالْعَافِينَ عَنِ النَّاسِ وَاللَّهُ يُحِبُّ الْمُحْسِنِينَ Hasten to protection and forgiveness. وَسَارِعُوا إِلَىٰ مَغْفِرَةٍ مِنْ رَبِّكُمْ That a paradise awaits you greater than the earth and sky put together. But this is a calling for the God-conscious one. Or lil muttaqin. Who are they? Alladina yunfiquna fi sarra. They give charity in good times and in bad times. Sarra wa darra. Wal kaadimin al ghayb. They hold back their anger. They swallow it. They don't get angry easily. They're not out there to vent. They don't vent. You know why they don't vent? Because they see the mercy of God. They see too much grace. 
They see the uselessness of anger. They don't find value in it, for anger is poison. Anger causes more anger, which leads to more destruction. And then when we wake up from our anger, we find we've destroyed too much. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and they forgive mankind. And they forgive mankind. Do you and I forgive? How willing are you and I to forgive? I use the example of vindictiveness as follows. I heard it from somebody, it's brilliant. It says, take a half-filled bottle of water, even an empty bottle. Hold it like this. I ask you, is it heavy? He said, no, 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 not heavy. I can hold it. An hour later, oh, it's okay, I can still hold it. Two hours later, it starts going down. Three hours later, like this. But you keep doing this. 24 hours later, it's really hurting. This bottle is vindiction. I'm carrying something somebody did yesterday and I can't let go. And my body is trembling. It doesn't move, it's going into paralysis, but I can't let go of that bottle. Do you get it? That's us. I can't forgive. Allah says, if you don't forgive, you die. Allah says, Qul Tell them, die in your anger. For what is it with you? You're asking for God's mercy when you should be forgiving, when you should be loving, and when you should be caring and sharing and giving and forgiving. No, I'm angry. Why did this person do this to me? Why? I'm entitled. The universe is for me. Really? Alhamdulillah, it is for you. But you are the universe. That's what you forgot. So the verse I started in Surah Al-Hashr, Allah beautifully says, Ya ayu alladhina amanu attaqu Allah, wal tanzur nafsun ma qaddamat li ghad. All you who believe, be careful of your duty to Allah, and let every soul consider what it has sent on for tomorrow. And be careful of your duty, surely Allah is aware of what you do. The second verse, وَلَا تَكُونُ كَالَّذِينَ نَصُوا اللَّهِ and be not like those who forsook Allah, so he made them forsake themselves. When you and I are indulgent in haram, and we are poisoning our bodies, we have forsaken Allah, and therefore Allah says, I forsake you. And when you forsake yourself, you become destructive. Now you kill yourself. And the sad thing that I mentioned, and Allah says here, these it is who are the fasiqeen. Who are the fasiqeen? Fasiqoon, transgressors, people who put themselves in a state of peril. Fasaqa in Arabic is when you put yourself in danger. Why? We've lost hope. But Allah says, tandur nafsun, beware of what you send tomorrow. Tomorrow is what counts. You and I today are the product. If you look at yourself in the mirror, no, you are who you are because of your thoughts yesterday. What you thought yesterday is what you are today. Don't forget that. We are who we are. If you go back 10 years, 5 years, a year, examine what were you thinking then, you will see I'm here now. I was thinking that way, I'm here today because of that thought. Okay? So if you know that, and we are the product of yesterday's thought, then why don't we, why don't we dictate tomorrow for ourselves by today's thoughts? So let's change our thoughts today. And let's refrain and reform ourselves by which to become cognizant of our duties and you take into consideration just one thing when you see a dog when you see another creature even when you see humans say wow I'm human that's amazing that's incredible I'm human I could have been born anything wow God says now what do you want with it you don't like it create trouble I give you free expression. Go kill people, steal, cheat, lie, stab yourself, kill yourself. You can. Allah says, Inna hadayna hu sabila, imma shakiram wa imma kafura. He guided us to the path. Whether we are grateful or ungrateful. Are we grateful? You know, when you look at Karbala and we look at these companions, they were extremely grateful. The world is watching, gasping, like, oh my God, they're going out there to get killed. I, I, how do they have such guts? They've taken an account. We're grateful. 
What God has given us, we can't pay back. And shame on us if we stand in front of God when we pray, thinking we're doing something. Allah says in the Quran, يَمُنُّونَ عَلَيْكَ أَنْ أَسْلَمُوا قُلْ لَا تَمُنُّ عَلَيَّ إِسْلَامَكُمْ بَلِ اللَّهُ يَمُنُّ عَلَيْكُمْ أَنْ هَدَاكُمْ لِلْإِيمَانِ Surah Al-Hujurat, Allah says, they put a burden on us, on you, يَمُنُّونَ عَلَيْكَ أَنْ أَسْلَمُوا You know, when people became Muslims in the early days with the Prophet, they were like, I did a favor. See, I accepted Islam. I've done a great thing for you. They used to look at people who are not Muslims. Ah, kafir, kafir, najis, kafir. Like, oh, I'm special, you see, I've become a Muslim. So that's kafir now, you see. He's going to hell, I'm going to paradise. Really? Since when did God allow such attitude? We are, many of us, by the way, especially in the Abrahamic religion, sadly, are experts in sending everybody else to hell. Jews do that, Christians do that, we Muslims do that, Sunnis do it to Shia, Shias do it to Sunni, we all do it. Oh, he's going to hell, oh, yeah. it's paradise only for me. Like really, Allah created billions of people, just only you can go to paradise. And that's, God is merciful. So God takes the majority, throws them in hell, but not me, because <laughs> I'm very special. That's not Islam. Nowhere in the Quran does Allah ever say such things. Never. Indeed, the believers, the Jews, Christians, the Sabians, provided you believe in God and promote good deeds. And believe in Allah, believe in the Day of Judgment, and do good deeds for you. لا خوف عليهم. There is no fear for you. Do not fear. لا خوف عليهم. ولا يحزنون. And don't be distressed. For mercy is for you. So I speak with sincerity to my young generation especially. Please, I know we live in a caustic environment. An environment that's usually rough and tough. I know, I see people, if you're not tough and you don't carry those guns and you don't walk around with some mannerisms by which to protect yourself in this wild, wild west we call it, that you may not survive. You learn to be crude and rude and harsh and you think it's the only way to live. This is not the way Allah wants us to be. Allah wants us to be gentle and calm and kind and wise and patient with wisdom. These are the qualities of the people of Karbala. You know why we revere them? It's because of this. They were so majestic in their character. They had the sublime nature by which the inner qualities came out. Why? Because they consciously examined the inner souls. You and I must examine our inner souls. How often do you and I meditate? You know in our school in Michigan at Wise, for the first 10 minutes all our students have to meditate. They meditate, they introspect. And if you have ever done guided meditation, it's amazing. When we talk about intelligence, there's one thing to call emotional intelligence. You might think IQ is where the real reason lies. Intelligent caution is the intelligence level of being able to see things in, in a rational way. People with very high IQs don't necessarily succeed in life. In fact, some of them fail. Though they score the highest scores in school, they don't succeed because there's a whole dimension of social transactions that are essential to complete a human being. And perceptions are what drives us. Researchers have studied that human beings' first six years upon birth is entirely emotional. You know, when you speak to a child who's five years old and you're being rational with them, you must not do A because of B, because of C. They have no idea. They're just smiling. Uh-huh. Yeah, okay. Sure. Whatever, mom. Sure. They're not understanding. They're seeing your smile. They're seeing your body language. They're sensing your energy. That's all they're doing. They're highly emotional. Children are not logical or rational. This is why when we listen to the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad You find he said every human being has three stages First seven years <clears throat> Second seven years and the third seven years First seven years your child is a prince Or a princess Second seven years your child is like a servant 
obeying your commands. In the third seven years, your child is your advisor. These are not haphazard conversations. Harvard has done studies. Top universities in the world, including Stanford, did studies on these matters where they found out that this is brilliant. This is exactly what the prophet has stated. Stanford did a study just exposing the power of patience. Patience. You know, the professors who come to Stanford used to bring their children to uh, this nursery. So they decided to conduct research many years ago. And it was a profound research to show you when Allah says, Inna Allah ma'as sabirin. فبشر الصابرين الذين إذا أصابتهم مصيبة give good news to the patient one. Allah is not talking randomly. He created us. He knows us. So they took these kids at Stanford and told them that we want to give you a marshmallow. Kids love marshmallows. But if you wait ten minutes, the person says, "I'm just going to go outside and do a quick errand. When I come back, if you can wait, I'll give you two marshmallows." Simple, isn't it? Simple. So one group of kids says, no, 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 I'm not waiting. I want my marshmallow now. We are like that, right? Many of our kids. Mom, if you don't give me my iPhone right now, I'm going to stop breathing. <laughs> right? <clears throat> I'm going to scream. Please, don't scream, please. I'm, I'll be embarrassed. Now. It's the now generation. Highly impulsive. You see that. And then it leads us to become compulsive. Hmm? So those kids said, I want the marshmallow. Then a group of them said, no. For two marshmallows, we will wait. Now you know for a five-year-old, 10 minutes is like eternity. They bite the nails like, marshmallow, when is this marshmallow come? Oh my, 10 minutes. Guy goes outside, comes back 10 minutes later, gives his kids two marshmallows. They followed these kids till teenage till late teenage, till the 20s. And all the kids who asked for marshmallows immediately were flunkies, depressed, into drugs, lost, out of focus. And all the kids who waited were successful, focused, planning their future. Just a little explanation of a child's ability to sustain 10 minutes of patience by which to get marshmallows is indicative of what you and I really are. So when Allah says, well, nafsun ma qaddamat li ghad, Take care of yourselves, for you are the universe. You might think outside is your universe. It's peripheral to your universe. So please understand, brothers and sisters. On that day, Allah says, Yawma la yanfa'u malu wa la banun. Salim. On that day, la yanfa'u malun, your wealth, wala banun, nor your family will help you. Look at us today. We're all charging to build our empire on this earth. I need my fancy car and my fancy watch and my fancy house. And if I don't have it, Machiavellian style, I'll cheat and I lie. And I'll be a crooked and I'll say, Allah Raz. <laughs> and then I'm going to cheat you. Hmm? Hajj. I went to Hajj. Oh, good. You're Hajj. You're honest. Here's my thousand dollars. Good. Yalla, yalla. Run away with it. Because you know, you hide under that. Why? Did Allah say to do that? No. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, none of this stuff you're running for is going to help you. La yanfa'u malun wa la banun. Illa man atallaha bi qalbin. Qalb, my heart. When it's at peace, it will help me. So Allah says, on that day, your mother, your father could be standing next to you. Ya nas rabbakum yawman la yajzi walidun an waladi wala mawludun huwa jazin an walidihi shay'a. Wow, this is deep. In Surah Luqman, Allah says, O oh mankind, beware of that day. The father won't help the son, nor the son will help the father. Hmm? Your universe is you. You and I will be saying, Nafsi, Nafsi. On that day, Allah says, On that day, you will be broken into three groups. Hmm? Ashab al Yameen, Ashab al Shimal, and Sadiqun al Sadiqun, Ulaikal Mukarrabun, Fi Jannatil Naim. Three groups. 
You and I, in this conversation tonight, should make a promise that since I am the universe and I have been blessed to be human, I will abstain from the haram and I will abstain from the poisons. You know, when I see my brothers and sisters working out, keeping themselves fit, being careful of what they imbibe and drink and eat, and only good food that they eat, I said, bravo, bravo, I admire you for that. For that's how you and I should live. For on judgment day, the body will speak for you or against you and say, oh Allah, this creature that you endowed me to be his skin, took care of me. So stop this nonsense of drinking. And by the way, uh, drinking and smoking, you find unfortunately, secondhand smoke in cigarettes and in shisha is more dangerous than shisha for the one who takes it. Now don't say, oh, that's even better now, alhamdulillah. That's not the point, it's already dangerous. It's already a hundred times worse than cigarettes. But people who get around you, you're killing them. So that's what we call social irresponsibility. And Allah will question us on judgment day. You poison the environment knowing that you're hurting others. You know, if I go into a room with shisha, my head spins. I get dizzy, I get sick. I come back and say, what is that stuff? And there are people who live by it. Why do they live by it? Because we have lost hope. Why? Because we think the external components are the solutions to our lives. And I'm saying this vociferously without any hesitation that the real solution is not outside, the solution is inside. We have students who come who have a very negative attitude when they come to school sometimes, you know, they got off the bed from the wrong side. They're angry, but I don't want to study today, or they are, you know, contentious in class, they want to challenge the teacher. So in the afternoon, we take them for meditation. They all come in this big hall in our, in our theater and they all do meditation. Those same boys and girls who had negative, they walk out with positive thoughts, smiling, shaking hands, and we say, observe. Observe 10 minutes of inner thought of meditation. Look at the change in this guy's behavior. And that's all it takes. And the minute you're smiling and you're feeling good, you no longer have a desire to smoke. You no longer have a desire to curse. You no longer have a desire to do haram. What is the reason for that? Because you took account of yourself. Alaykum, as I mentioned yesterday. Alaykum, ya yuladina amanu. Alaykum, anfusakum. Take care of yourselves. Allah says, I have endowed you with too much within yourselves. And the solution lies in you. You and I are humans. We are extremely intelligent. Researchers show that if you just imagine that you're taking something that's positive for you, your body reacts positively. You might call it the placebo effect, psychosomatic induction, which we call where your brain produces the results without any outside agency of chemistry, and your body internally now begins to react. Researchers show that when you complain, you actually create what we call neural pathways in your brain with glial cells. And it becomes so habitual after a while that because you have so many pathways to complaining, that 24 hours you're complaining. So let's not think, oh, I only complain because it's a very good reason for me to complain. No, it becomes a habit. And then suddenly you find people are constantly complaining. No matter what you give them, they're always seeing the glasses half empty. Because they are so addicted to complaining. So you might think smoking is an addiction. Even complaining is an addiction. Even cursing is an addiction. Even looking at people's faults is an addiction. All of these requires dhikr of Allah. Alladina yadhkuroon Allah. You know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions this beautifully. Inna fi khalq samawati wal ard wa akhtilaf al-layli wa nahar la ayatin li ulil albab. Alladina yadhkuroon Allah qiyaman wa qu'udan wa ala junubihim wa yatafakkaroon fi khalq samawati wal ard. They make reflection. They are constantly standing, sitting, lying on their sides. That in the creation of this universe and the alternation of night and day are signs for people deeply rooted in knowledge. They reflect standing, sitting, lying on their sides, wondering what is this universe all about. Researchers have found in today's modern world that when you and I can touch the nerve of why, you will know what to do and how to do. 
If you cannot touch the why, meaning why is thing, are things happening the way, you won't know what to do with what nor with how. You will be confused and when you don't know the why of things, you start to destruct. You start to smoke, you start to get into fights, you start to look for faults. Everything negative starts to become your modus. It becomes your nature. When Allah says, my zikr will calm you down. What is my zikr? I am the cause. You are the effect. And your effect is dependent on the cause forever. And I guide you for ultimate goodness. I made you and there is nothing in the universe you can do to escape my, your return to me, Allah says. If you and I simply know this and focus, now when a friend says, hey, come, let's smoke this. Says, no, sorry, I don't need this. Well, come on, there's a party going on. All the friends are, no. It's one thing, by the way, teenagers, teenagers suffer the most is loyalty. My God, loyalty. You know why teenagers suffer from loyalty? Loyalty. I've had kids who come to me and say, Hajj, I go to clubs, I do haram, I smoke, I do this, I do this, I've decided to stop. I said, you ready to stop? He said, yes. I said, where's your phone? He said, here. I said, I can guarantee you the next five minutes you're going to get a phone call. He looks at me and said, how do you know? I said, watch. I said, I dare you. When that phone rings, if you pick it up, you're lying. Five minutes later, his friends are calling. Hey, where are you? Come on. Sending text messages. He says, Hajj, they're, they're, they're calling me. I said, go ahead, pick it up. He said, no, no, I know. I said, see, they're calling you, aren't they? Loyalty, you need that. And if you say no, and you don't answer them, they'll curse you. And if they curse you, you no longer have friends. And if you have no friends, oh, you're like alone in the desert. Oh my God, I have no friends. I'm gonna die. They don't love me anymore. Where am I gonna go now? I'm so bored. Well, I'll do anything for you, brother. Hmm? You know, I've been there doing this for too long. Right? Isn't it true? Hmm? Now, the day you give it up, person says, but brother, if I lose all my friends who are asking me to do this haram, but I know it's wrong. I said, I got two options for you. Don't answer them or answer them. But if you do answer them, there's a condition. You're going to change them. Hmm. And you're going to stop them. Oh, brother, I don't know. I said, well, as Allah says in Quran, Ya Yahya, khud al kitab bi quwa. Oh, Yahya, take the law by the hands and move. Are you ready to go to your friends and say, excuse me, I don't think we should do this today. What? Are you kidding me? I'm the one who set, sets the trend. You're going to follow me. No, 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 no. I'm not going with you. What happens to your friends? They'll curse you. They'll damn you. They'll threaten you. Loyalty. I know people who are in their 40s and 50s who haven't given up this teenage loyalty. Even after they're married. Even though they're the kids, they're still loyal. They're living like children. They haven't grown. Subhanallah, what happened to us? When we cry for Imam Hussein, who sacrificed everything, companions who give everything. You and I cry, hey heart min dilla. Hussein, oh my God, look at people today. His message continues to grow. The message of Imam Hussein is causing revolutions today in the Middle East. It's the lovers of Imam Hussein who are causing the tyrants to be afraid. Netanyahu cannot sleep at night, not because of anybody, but because of the lovers of Hussein. Remember that. If there's one group of people he is afraid of that he can't sleep at night, it's the ones who love Imam Hussein. Don't forget that. Study it. You will see. It's the lovers of Ahlul Bayt who are shaking the world today and demanding justice. And there's nothing in the world they can do to stop us. That's the power we have. And I conclude on that tonight. That we go to Karbala and you see old companions. People who lived with the Prophet, seeing trials and tribulations upon the Prophet. From good moments to horrible moments. People like Ammar. Ammar ibn Yasser was a companion of the Prophet. Who was one of the early companions of the Prophet. When he became a believer. You know when I went to visit his grave in Raqqa. I cried. I cried so much when I was on his grave. Raqqa. You know where the ISIS today is. And I remember touching his grave. I said Ammar. You are a companion of the Prophet. How did you have this energy oh Ammar? I am a servant of God pretending to be good. I need your spirit. Teach me how to be a follower the way you followed the Prophet. The way you followed Amir al-Mu'mineen up to your old age that you didn't give up this life until you did it for Allah. 
You Ammar. I asked myself when I was in his grave, and I said, Ammar, as you know, the Prophet said, Oh Ammar, disbelievers will kill you. And they will be wearing, they will be carrying black flags. It was Muawiyah's flag. And it was Muawiyah's army that killed Ammar. And the believers all remembered. The Prophet said, disbelievers will kill Ammar. Ammar ibn Yasir was one of the most honorable companions of the Holy Prophet. Ammar in old age went to Raqqa to teach people to pray. Imam Ali salam had become the Khalifa at the time. Muawiyah had already positioned himself as the governor of Damascus. Imam Ali sends him a, a, a notice. Step down, you're no longer the governor. I'm the Khalifa, you're no longer the governor. Muawiyah refused. He challenged Imam Ali salam, And Muawiyah was killing indiscriminately, causing fitna. So Imam puts together an army and he moves from Kufa, coming towards Damascus through Raqqa. That mountain was called Safin. It's high mountains, you can see it, hills, flat surface on top, and you can see it. When I was there, the Euphrates is right there. I stood there, I said, once upon a time, the footsteps of our blessed Imam was here. Once upon a time, the footsteps of Imam Hassan and Imam Hussein was here. This is why Ziyara is so good. Ziyara, visit Ziyara, visit. If you can, touch the surface, feel it. Feel the energy, it will live with you forever. If you and I want to escape the bala of this dunya, go to these people, hold on to them. Say, you are my role model, I want to live, I want to live by your standards. Ammar ibn Yasser was like that. But I always imagine in my day-to-day -day troubles that I have in life, I say, what is my trouble? Oh, I have a problem here, I have a problem here, have, and now I'm ready to, to condemn my, you know, my society. I'm ready to condemn everybody. I maybe even go and ask Allah, like, what wrong did I do? Then Ammar comes in front of my image, says, you're complaining? How about me? I became a Muslim early on. And then my parents joined me, my mother, Samaya, hmm? and Yasser. And in front of my eyes, they were both killed in front of my eyes. They were stabbed with spears, and I watched my mother die in my hands. I watched my father die in front of my eyes, hmm? By my, in front of me. My parents were both shuhada, killed. The first martyrs to be killed in Islam were Ammar's parents. Subhanallah. You and I would have become Muslim still? You know what? I was a pagan before. I became Muslim. My parents became Muslim. And look at the bala. Both of them died. No. Ammar says they became shuhada. They got closer to Allah. They are not dead. La taqulu li man yuqtalu fi sabili la yamwat. They are alive. They are alive. So really Ammar, you have that belief? For every time I have a little problem, I'm ready to condemn God and condemn religion and condemn my Islam. You have that much courage, oh Ammar? Ammar says, yeah, you are a fool if you condemn. You're a fool if you lose hope. Never lose hope, oh Hassan. Don't lose hope. This is a companion. Hmm? Then Ammar was doing wudu. He sees a cloud of dust. He inquires, who's that? He says, Amir al-Mu'minin Ali ibn Abi Talib has arrived and is going to now face Muawiyah's army. He pours the water. He said, what value is this water for wudu if I cannot pray behind my master, Amir al-Mu'minin? He ascends his horse. You know how old? Ammar was an old man, very old man. He climbs up the horse and he rides up the hill and he joins Imam Ali alayhi salam and becomes martyred in the battle of Siffin, an old man. If that is not a lesson for you and I on earth to live by as a why, as a purpose, as a goal, that when shaitan brings me drugs and brings me alcohol and brings me haram, I said, no, my objective is the Prophet and his Ahlul Bayt through the footsteps of these great companions, Ammar ibn Yasser, shame on me. Tonight, same old people, how honorable they were. You know, in that age, as I mentioned the other day, holding a sword in old age is not easy. Swords are not light, they're very heavy. If they're light, they can snap. They didn't have the materials we have today, the alloys that we have today. Those were actual steel, heavy duty steel. To lift that with an armor, wearing an armor, wearing a shield on a horse or riding with arrows coming at you is not a joke. Yet you find these companions like Muslim ibn Awsaja. Imam Hussain in the tent says to him, I will turn this light off, you leave. Muslim looks at him and says, then what? 
You die and we live on? What for? Life has no meaning without you. Allah on Judgment Day will question us that you are our master. Allah has commanded us to love you. Hmm? Even the Prophet said, لا أسألكم لا قل لا أسألكم عليه أجرا إلا المودة في القربة. The Prophet said, I want no reward from you, but that you love my near ones, and my near ones are my قربة. اللهم إن هؤلاء أهل بيتي وخاصتي وعمتي لحمهم لحمي ودمهم دمي. Prophet is talking about his Ahlul Bayt. Imam Hassan, Imam Hussein were there when the Prophet made this dua in front of the Christians and in front of everybody else. Hmm? So you find that he says, Muslim Ibn also just says, We can't leave you. I swear to God, if I am burnt and brought back 70 times, I will not quit fighting with you. This is an old man. Hmm? Old man in his 70s. You find what valor. You know my dream? Long term thinking Allah says, Well tandur nafsun ma qaddamat ligad. Pay attention what you will do for tomorrow. Then let you and I have this fantasy that my Lord, when I reach the age of Ammar, when I reach the age of um, Muslim, when I reach the age of Anas ibn Harith, oh Allah, give me that strength. That even if I'm 100 years of age, I don't quit in doing your work. God forbid I lose hope the way shaitan lost hope in you. God forbid that when I get old, I lose hope in my path. So you find that Muslim bin Awsaja goes forward and as he's fighting an old man and he gets struck and now he's breathing his last, Imam Hussein notices him, he goes towards him and says, how lucky you are. And Allah recites, uh, the Imam Hussain recites the verse, you know, Minal Mu'minina Rijalun Sadaqu. He recites this ayah that among believers are those who have kept, who have given themselves. Some have done it, some are waiting. So, as you know, Muslim bin Ausaja was from the Banu Asad tribe, and they were all from Kufa. You find that Habib ibn Madahir was also from the Asad tribe, and they were friends. And Habib ibn Madahir is next to a Muslim. And Muslim bin al Sajah is breathing his last bleeding. And they say Habib ibn Madahir is wiping off the dirt on his face. That relationship of people who long, says Allah says, Fatamannu al Maut in Kuntum Sadiqeen, have this desire to become Shaheed if you're truthful. I look at such people and I say, You are old. Your parents were killed in front of your eyes. You never quit. You love Allah so much because you were so connected with this great grace of God. That in your old age, you didn't use that as an excuse. Though Allah has excused you from fighting due to old age. Allah is in Quran says, if you're old and you're sick, you're not obligated to fight. But they said, no, no. We cannot live this life of being humiliated except with dignity and what an honor to get shahada what an honor and muslim said he said but that's 70 times i will be killed and i will be born again to fight for you will not happen i will only die once and i will be alive forever oh hussein oh my master how can i not die for you so as he is breathing his last habib is wiping his face and says, how lucky you are to be ahead of me in reaching the pool of Kawthar and to see the messenger and Amir al-Mu'mineen and Fatima al-Zahra and all the prophets. How lucky you are to see that. They see it. Long-term vision. They see it. And he said, before you die, Muslim, what is your last wish so that I can fulfill it? Imagine Habib ibn Madahir on a battlefield while swords are being wielded and blood is gushing everywhere. Death is all around them. He's having such a deep conversation. They are the ones who are reflecting, standing, sitting, remembering, Rabbana ma khalaqta hadha batilan. Subhanaka, my Lord, you didn't create this in vain. This is meaningful. And you know what? Muslim bin Awsaja, as a companion of the Prophet, Hafiz of Quran, says, 
You would think that he would say, okay, well, say goodbye to my family, I miss them. Nothing, nothing. He, in his weak voice and his weak finger while he's bleeding, he looks at Habib ibn Madal, then he looks at Imam Hussein who's standing next to him, he says, don't ever leave this man. Keep fighting and defend him until your last breath. This is my last will. And he, believe me, historians are stunned by this sentence. They care for nothing but the agent of Allah. This is what true love of Allah implies. And you find that Muslim bin al breathes his last, and Habib ibn Madahir, they all say, Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'un. Anas ibn Harith was also present. Brothers and sisters, Anas ibn Harith, his eyebrows were hanging. He couldn't see. He was that old. Okay? He comes to Imam Hussein for permission to go forward to fight. Can an Imam look at the person of this old age and say, go fight? Imam looks at this man's valor, his sparkling eyes, and says, I am ready to go. An old man. Historians say he took his belt, you know, and he tied his eyebrows so that he can see. That's the valor we're talking about, Islam. When you and I stand up on that day, and you say, I am so careful of my duty. Not only will I avoid the haram, but I'm going to rise to the occasion that when I am called to fight for justice, I will make sure I am effective to kill the enemy. You know, you find that he ties his eyebrows, ties it, and then ascends his horse. And then he rides forward towards the enemy, and Anas ibn Harith also becomes shaheed. Imam Hussain alayhi salam witnesses all of these people and he carries them back to the tent upon their death. This was truly, truly a heavy burden. May Allah give us the patience, the tawfiq to understand and to reach this enormous stage of sacrifice. Brothers and sisters, maybe we will never be in that stage like Karbala, but every single day there is a little Karbala in us. Please, let's practice that. ألا لعنة الله للقوم الظالمين وسيعلم الذين ظلموا أي منقلب ينقلبون بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ربنا اغفر لنا ولإخواننا الذين سبقونا بالإيمان ولا تجعل في قلوبنا غلا للذين آمنوا ربنا إنك رؤوف الرحيم Let's recite five times أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعا ويكشف السوء We ask Allah سبحانه وتعالى to cure our ailments to cure our uh, those who are in need of our prayers to keep us healthy and to give us wisdom and vision to avoid all the dangers of this society so we become the true role model soldiers to hold the banner that Allah created us for.
Yeah.